What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Respect and Pray Show with yours truly, Miguel Mike Medina, Triple M. In this episode, I had the privilege to interview someone who has been in the sports media world for several years. He's a big fan of the New York Mets. He has experience in producing. He also has um, his own podcast, which he's the host. He's a writer. He's done board operator. He's done so much in the sports media world. So in this interview, you'll get to know more about this person from his early beginnings all the way to now. So stick around because it's a good one. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to present to you, Mr. Anthony Rivera. Anthony, thank you for joining the show today. Hey, man, I'm very excited. Very happy to be here, Miguel. And uh, let's do this, man. This is very exciting for me. For sure, for sure. So I got to start from the top. When did you fall in love with sports? And did you always knew that you wanted to work in sports media? Actually, I didn't know I wanted to do sports media. And I've, I've loved sports since um, right around, you know, 94, 95. I started watching football and getting into the Super Bowl. I actually didn't really get into baseball, which I cover mostly now until 1998 and I started watching the the New York Mets and started getting into baseball and I honestly started actually listening to sports radio during that time too where you had like the big you know Mike and the Mad Dog was the big thing back then uh, in New York sports so uh, I enjoyed listening to it and and you know watching sports but I didn't really get into um you know sports radio as a passion and as as a job until maybe about i want to say eight years ago so i mean it, it, it was a big change from what my career path was in the beginning so um i'm glad i went into this direction and i love doing it and speaking of mike and the mad dog they recently reunited and first six so that was cool to watch but since you're a passionate mess fan you started watching in 98 which was the beginning of the Mike Piazza era. What was the first Mets game you ever attended? So the first game I ever attended was also in 1998. Um, it was probably the fifth game of the season at home. They were playing the Pirates. I know my dad took me to that game. I got pictures. I still have the ticket stub somewhere. Uh, you know, it, it locked up in a, a photo album. And um, it was actually the debut of a pitcher uh, for the Mets named Masato Yoshi. He was a, a Japanese import and they um, brought him in. And that was the first time he pitched in the majors. And it was the first time I got to see them play. And they won pretty, pretty handily too. I think it was like eight, nothing or something. So it was, a, it was a very fun time. And then, you know, eventually, like you said, it was the beginning of the Mike Piazza era. So that was a, it was a great time to get into w watching the Mets. So before um, your radio journey, you attended John Jay which you study for criminal justice. What made you decide wanted to study criminal justice? So at the time, I was very interested in um, crime scene investigations. You know, like the TV shows were big then, right? So you had like CSI and like, oh, actually it was like all the different CSIs, like York, Miami. I mean, they had a whole bunch of them. Um, so that kind of really drawed me in. And then I took a, a class in high school in my senior year, which was kind of like a, a, a crime scene investigation class. And um, I really enjoy, I guess not enjoy, but I really liked the whole process of, you know, trying to figure these things out, you know, uh, and, you know, trying to put together, you know, the crime and, and all that stuff. And uh, eventually it led me to going to John Jay. And then a few years later, Connecticut School of Broadcasting radio and television you were there for from 2013 to 2015 um i would go out to say that this was probably the beginning of everything that you're doing right now so what does commended what does connecticut school broadcasting mean to you and what did you learn from there i mean it definitely means a whole lot i mean it's got me to where i am right now uh, it's got me through this journey. Uh, I learned a lot, a lot of hands-on learning. And, you know, as you, if you go to certain schools, 
It's a lot of note taking, a lot of, you know, uh, tests and stuff like that. And nothing is very hands on. But at Connecticut School of Broadcasting, it was very hands on radio, television. Uh, they taught you news broadcasts, obviously uh, sports TV and radio broadcasting. So that was a, a fun journey to get me to where I am now. And I, I learned a whole lot. I, I really did. Uh, and the hands-on part is, is what really drew me in to doing that because you got to, you know, learn you know, how to use certain elements and, and use certain tools that, you know, I learned and I use on an everyday basis now. So it really helped and guided me to where I am right now. Is this one of those schools where they're very heavy on tuition or they're lenient? What would you um, range it in, in terms of that aspect? Um, you- when you say that, like, what do you mean? Like very... Because, you know, there's certain schools that they're very steep on tuition and there's some that they're really slow, there's some that's middle. So where would you put this one in? Um, I don't are think Are you still was... paying most of this day or no? Or no, 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 no. Um, I have already paid that off, but um, I, I don't think it is steep intuition compared to colleges like, you know, major universities and stuff like that. But it also depends on the person, too. You know, can can the person afford it? Because they might not be able to. They might have to take out loans and stuff. So I, I guess it really depends on the person itself who who's going there and their financial needs at the time. But, you know, I was able to. Uh, it took a while, but I was able to uh, eventually, you know, pay off all the uh, college tuition for that. Favorite breakfast meal. Favorite bre- breakfast meal. Got to go bacon. Crispy bacon, too. I like that soggy, you know, just barely made. Now I like my nice and crispy. Favorite food. Favorite food, man. That's a tough one. I'm going to go uh, either pizza or tacos. I got to throw them both in there. So I love them both. All right. All right. Favorite travel destination. Favorite travel destination. Well, me and my wife like going to Disney, so I'm going to have to throw Disney in there. Um, we've been there so many times and to Disneyland, too, in California. Uh, but the Florida version, because they got, you know, different resorts and, and, you know, nice areas to stay at down there. So I got to go, you know, with Disney World. The most talented Mets team to not win a title. The 1999 oh, Mets man. or 2006 Mets. What was the other? What was the first one you said? 1999 or 2006 the most talented team to not win a title i didn't think you were going to bring the 99 team in there but it's got to be 2006 i mean that team that was the first team that i thought was definitely going to win the world series they were so talented on offense i mean with david wright jose reyes carlos beltran delgado i mean that team was so talented they had a really good pitching staff that got hurt at the end of the season. And that, that was probably the demise uh, of that team. But um, yeah, I, I've never felt more than that. They were going to win a world series. And since they lost, I haven't felt the same way since even with 2015, uh, even with the team that uh, made it to the playoffs last year, which was uh, in my lifetime, that was the best regular season team because they won 101 games and I never seen them win a hundred games. So yeah, that, that 06 team that, that, that broke some hearts, <laughs> especially in the years to come after that as well. Last but not least for this game, your top three favorite Mets moments. Top three favorite Mets moments. Okay. So um, one of them is last year. Uh, the postseason game, uh, DeGrom's last game. I went to that game. Uh, all these are games that I've been to. So the DeGrom game was really good. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that seeing. I, I didn't, I actually didn't think that was going to be his last game, but it ended up being it. And that was the only game they won against the Padres. So that's probably three. Uh, two, there's a Subway Series game in 2006. 
the last game of the series, I think they, they were both tied one, one uh, in the series and uh, it was a Sunday night game. So Shea stadium was packed Mets fans, Yankees fans. And uh, I think the Mets were down three, nothing. Uh, Carlos Delgado comes up and hits a three run home run or they were down two nothing. Delgado hits a three run home run, gives them the lead. David Wright comes up next and he hits an absolute moonshot that it had to have left the stadium because I didn't even see it land. That's how like that was the biggest home run I've, I've seen him hit uh, in person. And uh, the Mets ended up winning that game. And it was cool to have bragging rights, you know, a Subway Series. It's it's a big time, big deal. The number one game for me was the 2000 postseason. I went to uh, game three, game three of the National League Division Series, Mets Giants. And um, it, it at the time, Shea Stadium was like hard to get to with with uh, during the postseason. I mean, we left like three hours early to get there. We didn't get there until the fourth inning um, because we had to take a bus from where we were parking, which was at Flushing Meadows Park, and it was far. Um, so we get to the game around uh, inning four. The Mets are are down 2 nothing. They end up tying it. But then we get extra innings, and we kind of got a full game back. It went to 13, so we got a full nine innings, even though we got there late. And then um, I can remember, you know, Pay, paying my cousin at the, I was like, just going to give him the money for the game, for the ticket. Cause he bought all the tickets and I hear Benny Agbayani hit the ball and you just see everyone jump up and standing. And I run down the stairs. Cause that's Shea stadium where we were sitting. I think it was, um, at the time, I think it was called the loge area. And there's like, you, you know, an awning above. So you can't see anything that's hit in the air and you can see the field, but you can't see anything that's in the air. So I start running down the stairs and all I see is Barry Bonds running to the wall and just stop and look up. And then I see the ball coming down and everyone just jump in the air and the Mets won that in extra innings. Um, That's like my all time favorite game. I could tell that story that I don't miss one beat of that story. There's a lot of other good games too. This year went to Keith Hernandez's um, retirement. And the Mets had a kind of like 86 type win there. Old timers day this year was pretty good too. But those three moments are, uh, I can probably recite every day. The Benny Hag Bayani, I remember it because I saw it. I remember it was on Fox. It was yeah. at 4 p.m. It was a yep. Saturday. They were trading to zip in that game and they came back on to win. And the game felt like an eternity that mm-hmm. because the game ended, I think it was like in the 13th inning. Yeah. And when he hit that home run, Shea Stadium just exploded. I remember that. But I think that ended up being the second longest game besides the year before that, when Robin the Ventura. Mets and the Braves, the Robin Ventura Grand Slam single. That's the I don't know if it's still the longest game ever, but at the time it was the longest game ever. I think it went like six hours. And that started yeah. at four o'clock too. It didn't yep. end until 10. Yep. I remember that game was on NBC when it was in will be on NBC. And yeah. then the Agbayani game was on Fox. So because I started watching baseball in 99. So, and it was so right we're the, the full- same, right? We're yep. like right at the same time. Yep. Yep. So, um, but that's interesting that you mentioned that. Cause I feel that Benny Agbayani, aside from, um, Mets Nation, I should say the Mets fans, he's like the, he's forgotten in certain ways, but Mets fans won't forget him, especially with that home run um, no, he, in yeah. 2000. So, but, um, but I, so when I saw the, the old timers game and I saw him there, I said, wow, I have so many years I haven't seen him. And also with so many other, um, Mets legends that were there, but I'm glad that in that aspect they did the old timers day, and I hope that they do it every year because it's good to see old faces um there. Yeah, you know, I, I was thinking other. about it. Um, I don't know if I would like them to do it every year, but maybe every couple years, maybe every other year, every you know three to five years. Uh, I don't want it to ever go stale for fans. Um. I know it's going to get harder to bring some of these guys back. Like, you know, obviously there's fans of the 69 team and the 86 team. I didn't get to watch those teams. 
So like when we talk about Benny Agbayani coming back and, you know, Jay Payton and, you know, obviously Piazza and Alfonso, when I think of those guys, that, that, that's my era of Met, you know, watching the Mets, you know, and anything after that, but it's always good to see, you know, the 86 team come back. Obviously we would have wished Tom Seaver was still alive. So at least we could see him. Um, unfortunately he passed away in 2020. And um, but, you know, a lot of good memories. Uh, the history is is pretty rich. I know the Mets get a lot of flack, but they you know, now that Steve Cohen is in charge, you know, he's been kind of shining a light, you know, a lot brighter on the history of the team. And it's good to see. So you've worked you've been working at Sirius XM Radio for eight years and counting. You start as a board operator to associate producer. And now producer, you're a, you also have your own podcast, Subway to Shane, um, which I have it on Spotify. Uh, Thank you. And you're, yeah, yeah. And also Better Sports Network, which you're the producer since September 2022. September 2022 is interesting because that's the same month that I started my own um, sports show, which I'm a sports anchor working from home. So September 2022 it will, will always be there as signature month for me. Mm -hmm. So out of, I won't say out of all of these, but all of these um, jobs that you have, my question to you is two questions, actually. Number one, how do you juggle it, having all these um, jobs, these platforms? And number two, are there any guests that you've interviewed that you, that you just say to yourself, Wow, I can't believe I'm really talking to this person or interviewing this person. So, yeah, juggling, it, it's hard, right? I mean, you know it, right? You got a couple of shows that you're doing, right? And and you know how hard it is to juggle these, these you know, positions. But you, it's kind of like fitting in a puzzle, right? You you find the time, you find the right puzzle piece at a certain time, and you you place it, you know, when you're ready and, and when you know it's it's correct. So that's that's kind of what I try to do. Uh, you know, every day I try to, you know, set out a schedule for myself so that I'm not, you know, uh, doing overkill or or getting to a point where I'm going to stress myself out. And I try to make time for each thing. And when I do it, it's so that, you know, at that time, that thing is the most important thing of the day when it comes to, you know, and I put my hardest work into that thing. So um it, it's been a tough juggle, but I, I'm still doing it today. So it must mean something, right? I mean, if I'm still doing all three of them now, it must mean something. And, you know, the Subway to Shea is kind of my passion project. And um, I've been doing it over the last two years. And um, for interviews, um, there's been, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of, the, I, I, I did, there's four interviews that I did. The first one, um, actually, I, I've done a whole lot of interviews with, you know, podcasters and bloggers, and, and they've all been great. Uh, some of them I bring back on to be co-hosts. Some of us have become friends and, you know, we, we switch on and off with content. I go on their shows. They come on my shows. So they have been great. But when it comes to like, you know, players and stuff like that, uh, the first interview of a player that I got was Glendon Rush. He was from the 2000 New York Mets team, and it was great to hear stories from him. Um, I got to interview Cleon Jones. He just uh, wrote a book that came out um, last year, and um, it was good to hear his story uh, going through life. Um, if you ever get to, I think it's called Coming Home, um, and uh, if you ever get a chance to read that, I, I would definitely pick that book up, as well as um, uh, Bobby Valentine. Uh, I had so many questions for him because I grew up during that era of the Mets and kind of getting in his mind of, you know, a lot of the backstage stuff that went on during that time with the Mets, uh, not always good, but um, he, he brought a lot to the story. Uh, I, I've even asked him, you know, what his thoughts were on bringing Mike Piazza in. And, and actually at the time he wasn't a big fan of it because they already had a catcher in Todd Hundley, who was a fan favorite on all-star uh, he was uh, he had just been through injuries and 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 was going to come back later on in the season. But the Mets pulled the trigger on Piazza because the team wasn't doing well, uh, too well at the time. They were kind of just, you know, uh, even keel. And, you know, he wasn't I, I didn't think he he was going to give me that answer. And and he did. And, uh, you know, definitely a, a good a good conversation with him. 
Uh, definitely one of my favorites is Nick Davis. He's a um, uh, he's a documentarian, and he did the thirty for thirty on the nineteen eighty six Mets. I must have watched that documentary maybe two or three times, and, and one of them was definitely to you know get some good questions in there, and it went from being an interview with him to just a plain conversation, kind of like what we're having right now. Like just, you know, two like friends talking it out and having a good conversation. He was awesome to talk to. And we did it for probably over an hour and I don't do my podcast. If it's a baseball player or something, and I have a lot of questions, I'll, I'll maybe go, you know, 40, 50 minutes, but this went over an hour and I wasn't going to cut any of that out. And usually I, I'll keep my podcast to like a half hour, you know, because, you know, even with me listening to podcasts and shows, my attention span is probably a half hour long. So I, I try to keep it that short so that, you know, yes, people can listen to it and then go about their day. If they're cleaning or in the car or wherever they're on their way to work, it's a quick listen and, and they don't have to take a lot of time doing it. But um, that one conversation with I know he even um, I even got the poster behind me. I don't know if you could see it. The 30 yeah, for see 30. It. Uh, Right there, once upon a once upon a time in Queens, a great documentary. I don't know if you saw it or yeah, I saw it, it. Awesome four four part series, behind the scenes, everything. You got the players coming back. You even got players you didn't think were going to talk that talk, like uh, Lenny Dykstra, and, mm -hmm. and that was a, that was, that was some of the best entertainment that I saw. Yeah, Lenny Dykstra was the one that caught me by surprise because you know of all of these issues that he's had off the field. Yep. So I didn't think that they were going to get him, but the fact that they got him. And he participated. I yeah, said, and the wow, players like, were so candid too, right? Like Daryl Strawberry, um, Doc Gooden. They were all candid about their issues during that time. And it was it was also good to see, you know, uh, uh I mean it wasn't great for the Mets, but it was it was good to see them kind of delve into what happened post 86, like them not re-signing Ray Knight or them trading Kevin Mitchell that kind of changed the shape of the team moving forward. Part of the reason why they weren't able to repeat and, and make this team a dynasty. Yeah, 30 for 30. Is, I love 30 for 30. I've basically, I state to every episode that they make because one of my goals is to direct uh, an episode of 30 for 30 in the future since I'm a filmmaker myself. So, but yeah, I've seen that one. I've seen the the Doc and Daryl um, documentary as well. That one was pretty sad. It was deep, but because it's one of those uh, what could have been um, situations if mm -hmm. they had never had these issues. I have but not seen that one yet. Um, I, I just found out that it's on Disney Plus. So I'm going to check. I put that in my queue and I'm going to check it out. But when it came out, I, I did not see that one. I also didn't see... The uh, was the Michael Jordan one. Was that a 30 for 30 as well? Or was that yes. something totally different? The last dance. The last dance. Was that 30 for 30? It's funny you mentioned that because I started watching um the last dance again last night. So because it's February and you know it's Jordan's birthday month and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I something was just telling me, you know, go watch it. Um, but it's on Netflix as well. It's on Netflix and on ESPN Plus as well. Good to know. I'll check that so, out. The only other one that I saw. And I know as being a Met fan, I'll probably get flagged for this, but the captain was really good about Derek Jeter. And that, you know, that's time I started watching baseball. So, you know, seeing Derek Jeter and going through his life and then, you know, his personal life, and he's pretty private. I mean, he, he mentions it a whole lot of times of how private he is and just seeing him come out and the person that he has become and, you know, he's got his kids and, and, you know, how his, his wife is with him. Uh, man, that that was a deep story. Uh, definitely, they did the whole 2000, you know, Mets in the Subway Series thing, which was uh, I had to shed a few tears for that. But um, yeah, man, that that was that was a good one too. I mean, it, whether you're a Met fan or not, or Yankee fan, whatever, whatever sports, you got to check out um, the um, the version of uh, the captain. Yeah, I'm a Yankee fan, born diehard Yankee fan. But the thing is, and yes, there's this rivalry between the Yankees and Mets, but me as a Yankee fan, I never despise the Mets like the way I do with the Red Sox. So I guess it's because we're both from New York. That's why I never really look at it as like a, oh my God kind of situation. But yeah, like I don't, 
I don't, I never despise them as like the way I do with Boston. It's different. But he was even, pretty contentious but, as a kid growing up, um, you know, yeah. uh, b- being a Mets fan and, 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 and going up against Yankee fans. Now, not so much. Now, as an adult, it's a little bit different. I don't, I, I, I don't know, maybe because this, you know, the teams have not been good sync, like in sync as they were back then. Now, you know, the Mets will be good. The Yankees will be okay. Or the Yankees will be good. And the Mets are totally terrible. Now this past year was a nice subway series. Cause both of them were in first place. Both of them had the best records in baseball at the time. And it was fun to see that. And uh, I hope that continues, you know, for both teams, it's good entertainment. I mean, it's good for ticket sales. So I hope it continues. Yes, for sure. For sure. Um, what advice will you give to someone who wants to get into sports media? Um, advice for sport. Um, if you're definitely passionate about it, then do it, you know, and you're going to work hard. It's not easy being in sports radio is not easy. It's not like you're going to have, you know, one job and you know, that's going to be it. You're going to be doing a lot of things, different things. And you may not start where you want to, but if you have that dream and you have that desire and you keep going after it, you're going to get to where you're going to want to be. You just got to keep plugging along and and never give up. Good advice. Where can people follow you and your work? Um, Mention all platforms that you have, everything at this moment. Yeah. So my personal Twitter is at aunt Rivera 86. Usually I use that for mostly like retweeting and stuff from my subway to Shay. I'm, heavily on uh at subway to shay on twitter uh instagram and i just started tiktok uh not too much into that one yet but as the season gets going i'll I'll probably do a lot more stuff on there in videos and i i hope to launch youtube within the next couple of weeks uh, a youtube page so i could do you know videos like this um and, and and post them as well so you can obviously follow me at subway to shay if you're a mets fan and uh, that's where I do most of my tweeting from. And then I write articles for um, Rising Apple, which is on the fan. I know you're on fan. Are you still on fan side as well? Yeah, I work for um, Jays Journal for fan side. All right. So when you know when the Mets and the Jays play this year, because now the they're going to be playing each other. Um, the Mets are going to be playing all the teams. Jay, like every team is playing each other now. They they switched up the schedule. So when that happens, I'm going to get you on and we'll talk Mets and Jays. So we'll get that going. Um, for sure. For yeah. sure. We should also, we should also do a Subway series in this year, Matt fan. I'm a Yankee fan. We should Absolutely. do that one at some point as well, whether it's on your platform or my platform. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's uh, definitely, you know, keep in touch moving forward. And this is what I like. I love content creators, you know, working together. Um, I just did an episode with a, a friend that I made. Um, his, ne- his name is uh, Matt Ibanez, and he has a pot- Mets podcast, and we became friends, and we go on each other's show. Uh, it's pretty cool to you know work with other content creators. Um, because it, there's there, there's a lot of world where there's competition and stuff like that, but uh, I'm not really into that. I'm just really into making good content, sharing the content out there, and if if someone wants to live, listen to it and uh, watch it, whether it's one person or 10 people or a hundred people, a thousand, you know, it doesn't really matter to me. It's just that I'm getting to do what I love and talking about the Mets and putting that content out there. But um, the, the, the rising apple, I think it's at rising apple blog. You can follow there. I, I write a lot of articles for the Mets. I should have one coming out either tomorrow or sometime next week uh, about the Mets trading for Al Leiter back in 1998. And he's going to be going into the hall, Mets hall of fame this year. So, uh, that, that article should be up soon. Uh, you can follow also at better network. That's, um, a lot of sports betting, a lot of fantasy sports, if you like that stuff and, and collectibles too, that they're getting into. So, uh, if you follow better network on Twitter, you can, um, you know, enjoy a lot of their programming well. And they got, you know, guys like Mark Malusis on there. Um, they have um, Lisa Ann on there talking sports and uh, a lot of uh, other fantasy sports and 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 collectibles and uh, betting. So that that's pretty cool as well. Great. You heard it, everyone. I'll put that information down below on the YouTube channel. Anthony, thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview with me. I know you have a crazy schedule. 
but I'm forever grateful that you're doing this. They did this for me. The Respect and Praise Show is all about giving people their respect, their praise for the work that they're doing, especially for those who don't have a massive social media following, who deserve more notoriety. I salute you to everything that you're doing. And keep going, man. Keep going. You're doing great. Miguel, this was awesome, man. I appreciate your time. Well, that does it for this episode of the Respect and Praise Show. Hit that thumbs up. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And you know my motto. Have mutual respect, mutual love, and mutual admiration. So stay tuned for the next episode.